Well, folks, the topic this morning, it's easy to divide doubt. When your pastor and I were talking about what's an easy way to divide the sessions, um, I usually like to have three sessions and do factual, emotional, volitional. So we have a fourth one. The issue we're doing this morning is, is so big, so common, so regular, I'd say virtually every Christian not only doubts at some time, virtually every Christian has this objection at some time. And it is, it is so common, and it has become, to me, the most common question I get dealing with the subject of doubt. And that is the question of the silence of God. And some ways to state the, the objection goes like this. You know, I've done everything the Bible's told me to do. I've memorized key verses. God says this and this and this, and I do it. And I don't know what the experience in Bill's life is, and I don't know what the experience in Karen's life is, but I'll tell you what, I don't see it. Now, I mean, does God not like me? Did I do the wrong thing? Did I not trust Christ? Did I not, I mean, what gives? Then, when I get together with other Christians, I find out that they're asking the same questions. How come it seems like God's absent in the world today? You know, what's going on? Is God ignoring me? And for those of you who were here yesterday, you know one of the biggest themes this weekend, which will come up in this PowerPoint, one of the biggest themes this weekend has been watch what you say to yourself. What you say, and when I say what, what you say to yourself, I mean what you think. When, when something's happening and you go, oh no, and you're just around the house by yourself. Let's say you're going fishing tomorrow, you were playing golf or you were whatever, and all of a sudden it starts storming like crazy and you hear it's gonna be like that for three days. And all you say to yourself is, oh no. You didn't verbalize that, but you know what you mean by oh no. And that, that's a key, because so often we tell ourselves the wrong things about the Lord, and oh no could mean God blew it again. I don't say that, but I know what I mean. And again, what we were saying yesterday was the worst things that happen to you are not the actual events, but how you download them. How do you interpret? What do you say to yourself about what happens? And if you take almost everything as an opportunity to say to yourself, God let me down again. Didn't answer my prayer again. I told him it had to be by this Saturday and the time's come and gone and he's done nothing. What gives? That's not what this verse says. That's not what this verse says. My experience of God is not what the experience scripture says. So, so what's happening? Now with that idea in mind, what are you telling yourself? Even if it's the, oh, and you know what that means. Rain all weekend. The game was canceled. I can't go out with my friends tomorrow as I planned. Somebody canceled. You know, whatever that means, we do the same thing with God. And I wanna know, what do you say to yourself or do you even catch that when you do that with God? Because I think you deepen this negative experience. So let's go ahead and, and uh, move into this. And first I wanna say this. First of all, this is an exciting, exciting, exciting time to be alive. I wished I were beginning my career instead of on the backside of it, and I could learn a lot of the things that are going on today. The first point I want to make is God is incredibly active in the world today. Now, I want to say that up front, because when people say, well, I don't know where he is, I never see him. I want to make two sorts of comments about how active God is. I want to say, first of all, that God is present supernaturally in the world, because that's the kind, when, when people ask me, where is God, they, I, to me, they generally mean one of two things. Where is God supernaturally? Where are these supernatural acts that they saw in the New Testament? And the second one, the second way they often mean this is, well, I don't care about supernatural. I just wonder where God is personally. Why doesn't he speak to me? Why doesn't he let me know what these issues are? So I want to take a minute here before we get into this and discuss two topics. Is God supernaturally present in the world today? And is God personally present in the world today? How do we know those two topics? And the overall theme is, if we miss the stuff and tell ourselves all the oh no's of our faith, we're gonna get deeper into our 
despair over this question and not even realize that the answers are all around us, literally. I have a paper to give in just a couple weeks up in Milwaukee, a professional paper with professional philosophers. And they're Christians. It's a Christian philosophy conference. And what I want to say to them in this paper is, when we talk about Christian evidences, we usually mean things that happened in the first century and how can our research affirm things way back then. That's usually what apologetics means. But I'm suggesting in this paper that there is a new typology of apologetics that's come about in the last 30 or 40 years, which consists of, you, don't, you can do it without any reference to first century things. More evident, areas of evidence have, have popped up in the last 25, 30 years that have come in any other short period of time. Now, now why is this? I don't know. Maybe it's because apologetics, professional apologists, have gotten very, very specialized in the last few decades. Just 60, 70 years ago, the top apologists in the church were generalists. They were people who did apologetics plus a lot of other things, and they just generally addressed it. Today, the critiques about Christianity are so specific and the attacks are so strong that we have people who spend their entire life, say, studying the resurrection, or their entire life studying a particular argument for God's existence, or their entire life talking about morality and how we know morality has an absolute basis and you have to account for that and you can't account for it in a materialistic world. And things are happening today. In the last few years, some major... Uh, some major thinkers, non-Christians, have said that naturalism is on the way out. The, the worldview that has run the Western University, uh, say Western Europe, North America, Australia, for many, many decades is now going. And, and another book just came out by the well-known distinguished philosopher Thomas Nagel, an atheist, and Nagel says the subtitle of the book is why materialistic neo-Darwinism is almost assuredly incorrect. That's the subtitle. He's distinguished professor at large at New York University, and he serves in two departments, philosophy and law. Nice combination. So things are happening. And here's some of the things I just want you to know. God is alive and well on planet Earth, and we should keep that in background when we ask, why is God ignoring me? I don't know, but it's not because God's not here. God's around. For example, in recent years, there have been a lot of double-blind prayer experiments. I, I remember one crossed my desk as a chair of a philosophy department, and, and I saw this advertisement, and the top of the brochure was folded down, so I didn't see where it was. And I was looking down this brochure, and it said, it said, what about healing in the world today? That's what the brochure said. What about healing? What about answers to prayer? What about angels and supernatural and so on and so on? I'm thinking, whoa, who's sending me this brochure? It's probably some Christian group. Come study with us. And I flipped the top up, Harvard University School of Medicine. Uh, all right, that's not your normal advertisement uh, from them. I was at a major school recently, an Ivy League school, and I was told about a professor, an atheistic philosopher, who, if I understand the story, became a Christian. Guess why? A, a, a world-renowned philosopher became a Christian because he had an encounter with an angel. Yep. No way. Uh, you know, just ask him what was going on. I don't know. Well, one thing, and this, this is one of the Harvard, Harvard Medical School, the advertisement talked about, is there are a number of prayer experiments today double-blind prayer experiments. And the first one, the prototypical one, took place in a San Francisco hospital in the mid-1980s. And the cardiologist who was in charge was a man named Randolph Byrd. They asked about 400 people if they wanted to participate in a prayer experiment. And they said, you know, some of them would say normal things. Well, I'm an atheist, but I don't care if you pray for me. You know, like that, okay, we'll put you on the list. And they got just short of 400 people. And then, I was wondering about the ethics of this. 400 people asked, sure, pray for me. And then they, the, the medical doctor did not know who was being prayed for and who wasn't. 
Half of them were prayed for and half of them were not. So it's like, yeah, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Yes, yes, no, no way. Yes, yes, no. It's like, how come half of them are getting prayed for? Well, they surveyed these folks in, they kept track of their health. They were cardiac patients. They kept track of their health and they monitored them in 26 medical categories. And the results of this, because the results were so staggering, they were published in a peer-reviewed medical journal. <clears throat> and the Precy, if you can imagine this Precy for the peer-reviewed medical journal, the last sentence of the paragraph summary of the article is, the people who were prayed for got statistically better in 21 out of 26 categories. Last sentence, the results of the study are, are consistent with prayer to the Judeo-Christian God. That was in a peer-reviewed medical journal. Why? Because the 17 people doing the praying were all Orthodox Christians. Now, this is like a little too much for PC, right? This, this came out 25 years ago, and I don't even know if you'd see this today, but it was the prototypical one. So now other prayer experiments have done, and they've, it's hard for them to duplicate the results of this one, and science depends largely on duplication and some other things. They couldn't duplicate it. Well, one major school tried this, and they decided they wanted a PC group of prayers. So instead of using Orthodox prayers, they used medicine men, third world, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, this spiritual person, this guru, this, 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 this. And this particular experiment, if you were prayed for, you were slightly worse off than those who weren't <laughs> prayed for. And the ones who weren't prayed for got better a little faster. And they thought, well, what's going on here? All right, so more experiments were done, and nobody could back up this one from Randolph Bird from San Francisco. And finally, another one was found with 2,000 persons in Kansas City. And the results came out, published in another medical journal, statistically supporting prayer to the Judeo-Christian God, and all the prayers were Orthodox Christians. Now, I want to make something clear. I believe God answers prayers for unbelievers. I believe God heals unbelievers. He did it in biblical times. When people came to Jesus to be healed, he didn't say, believer, all right, no, get out of here. You know, he just healed, and it says he healed everybody in the town who came to him. I think God does those things. But, but the second one has these kind of results, and only Christian prayers, which caused a Duke University researcher to ask this question. After all these experiments, as far as I know, only three had positive results for prayers, and all three, the prayers, were evangelical Christians. And so this research from Duke University says, what? What is this? Prayer only answers, God only answers prayer for Christians? That was the researcher's question. Because that, okay, that's not my view. I'm just saying things are happening. Statistically, that's the key in this first one, statistically, statistically better in 21 out of 26 categories. Okay, that's one of the areas today. Next. I've advertised this book all over the place. I already did it at the university the other day. Uh, Craig Keener, prominent New Testament scholar, uh, PhD from Duke, with a minor in classical studies, Greco-Roman studies. And he has put together a two-volume set of works. If you're interested in this question, it's got to be on your shelf. It's the most captivating thing I've read in five years. In fact, I have to lead at the same philosophical conference in a couple weeks. I have to lead a whole panel with J.P. Moreland and some other guys, lead a whole panel on this. But Craig has collected hundreds of contemporary healing accounts. He puts them in this book with data. Many of them have backup pre and post MRIs, pre and post CAT scans, pre and post x-rays. And some of the reports are just absolutely incredible, almost unbelievable. I'll tell you just one. This woman had to have her spleen removed for medical reasons. And they removed her spleen. She's a Christian. And she's at her church, and they're praying for her and laying hands on her, praying that she'd be healed from this surgery where she lost her spleen. She goes in for the post-op checkup, and she has a fully functioning spleen. Now, I just told this to a group of medical doctors the other day, and they looked at me like, these, these were guys in a medical school. 
And they went, okay, and I said, now, what do you do when you have pre and post data? Disease, spleen, no spleen, spleen. <laughs> what do you do? And you say, well, that's not my experience. Okay, but it's somebody's. There's a little child who had to have a kidney removed. And they prayed over this child, these Christians, and when they went for the post-op checkup, the child had two kidneys. But get these books, they're the most incredible thing. I'll tell you just this one thing. I talk to agnostics all the time. I, I have guys that I witness with and chat with, and, and there's these two brothers from Canada, and we, we Skype for about an hour and a half every month. And I referred those two books to these guys, agnostics. They got the books, and next time they talked to me, they said, all right, we're agnostics, but the evidence of this book is just too much. We've got a confession to make. We now believe God heals people. So things are happening, and because of our new, some of our scientific documentation, we're able to, to, to document these things better than we've ever been able to in the past. Next. The topic I just mentioned, I should have saved the testimony of that Ivy League professor for right here. By the way, um, I have a photograph of the angel. <laughs> One of the guys sent it to me. He took it with his phone. Don't tell me, I just collect them. Next. <laughs> Next to the resurrection of Jesus, the area that I do the most work in is near-death experiences. I'm a peer reviewer for the only uh, peer-reviewed near-death journal in the world, not a Christian journal, Journal of Near-Death Studies out of University of Virginia. And um, I'll just say that this is probably the single most evidential category of things happening today. Um, and I'll, I'll just have to leave it at that. But this is all, this has all come about in the last 40 years. So the world is, is full of things going on. And I think I, you know, I date myself, as I said yesterday, by citing Simon Garfunkel, I'll do it again today, because as the 60s song says, too often we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Christians will go around and say, how come God's not active? How come God's not meeting my needs? How come God's ignoring me? And someone says, did you ever hear of this? Nope. Did you ever hear of that? Nope. How about that? No, I really haven't. This is pretty intriguing. How about that? Oh yeah, I've read some things on that, but have you heard this kind yet? No. Why is it that we're not aware of what's going on and yet we pontificate on what God's doing and not doing. And there's a lot of other things besides these. I'm, uh, the lecture I'm giving has nine categories where God's, I believe, supernaturally uh, alive today in, in measurable ways. So, so first of all, just to say, we need to solve the problem of why you think he's ignoring you, but God's not ignoring the world. That's my first point. Okay, second, there's a second category. Some people say, okay, okay, enough. I don't need evidence. I'm not like that. I just would like to get a letter, you know, using the example of the shack. I would like to get a letter in my mailbox with a heavenly postmark. I would just like to hear from God personally. I don't care if it's evidenced. I just want him to do something in my life. Now, so I have some questions for you. Because uh, I think we, again, look for love in all the wrong places. All right. How many of you, now, we have to be adults here like we were yesterday. I'm going to be the first one to raise my hand. How many of you, during a sermon, during somebody, a good friend who comes and talks, talks to you privately, and you realize you did something, hurt somebody, you didn't have any idea, and you just, while the person was talking, you just, the guilt just kept mounting while you heard this person's testimony or while you heard your pastor speak or a certain sort of thing. How many of you have ever been so convicted of a sin, you Christians, that you had to get home, shut yourself in your bedroom, and just get down on your knees right away because the Lord had been dealing with you with the conviction. How many of you? Okay, it looks like at least 50% of the hands have been raised. Now, what if I said to you, that is a personal act of God? Who do you think's convicting you? Your mother? <laughs> your father? If, you th if you're really, I remember one night, friends came down, I pastored up in Michigan, and they came down to see us in Virginia. And when everybody went to bed, the house was quiet. I was reading a passage of scripture in my quiet time, and I came across a phrase that applied to the four of us, the two couples. And I knew these, know these folks really, really well, and they were the, in the bedroom right across the hall. And I felt like waking them up and saying, 
This cannot wait till the morning. I am so sorry as your pastor and friend, I did this to you. So I told him the next morning over breakfast. But I will always remember that night how convicted I was. But it didn't occur to me, all I could think about was the conviction. It didn't occur to me that the Lord was dealing with me personally. Don't miss the forest for the trees. The Lord was dealing with me personally. Conviction of sin is a personal act from God to you. Okay, next. <laughs> How many of you have ever been put in time out by God? <laughs> a few of you. Okay. I've been there too. Time out is an act of love. In the book of Hebrews, it says, don't be um, discouraged when God treats you as children because those whom God loves, God disciplines. But be happy when he disciplines you because God is dealing with you. Again, don't miss the forest for the trees. Discipline is a personal act of God. Even time out, what, what, what do we often hear from psychologists? Children want to be disciplined in a way, I never did, but um, you know, some children want to be disciplined because they see it as an act of love. And the positive thing behind godly time out is that he loves us, and that's a personal sign. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Next. How many of you have at least one spiritual gift from the Lord? At least one. All right, that one's getting about 70% of you. Did you ever read 1 Corinthians 12? We don't make these things up. You don't act automatically get the gift of teaching because you're a professor or, or a school teacher. You don't, these things, Paul tells us, they're personal gifts from the Holy Spirit to you. Love letter. From the Holy Spirit to you. This is for you. God's given it to you. Use it for his glory. But we don't often think we often, I mean, I might think of a spiritual gift as something that makes me work at night when someone calls me with a problem. Oh, wow. Always during Monday night football. <laughs> and I don't look at it as a time to witness. I don't look at it as a time to help somebody. But it is a personal act of God. Don't miss the forest for the trees. Next. We talked a little bit this morning about worship. I have only in the last 20 years have been so moved by certain worship services. Because I was raised in a German Baptist church. Um, you know, religious experience can be different in a German Baptist church where I was taught you never, you never touch a woman and you never touch a man <laughs> except to shake hands. You know, just, you don't communicate with people. Someone's sitting there, but you don't often, and it wasn't highly emotional. And I was teasing yesterday as somebody raised their hand, everyone's looking, going, who is that, you know? Um, but so, so later when I moved out of that sort of situation, I realized, wow, if I've never felt like this before, but as I get in the car and drive home, I, I think, I know I was in God's presence this morning during that worship service. It was so uplifting. I know I was in the presence of God. This is incredible. And then I even made an argument for it. I published an article on this one day. If scripture argues like this and that and this, and I do this and this and this, and then I find that what he says is going to happen is what happens, why should I be surprised? It's exactly what he told me would happen when these certain things come about. So worship experiences say I've been in God's presence, but it is a personal act of God. So I want to couch this, the rest of this, my remarks, by saying that this is a world where God is involved evidentially, supernaturally, and secondly, personally. Now keep that in mind, because whatever you raised your hand for on some of these, or didn't, but you know, kind of check the box privately, uh, you know that God's dealing with you. But he doesn't always do exactly what you want, but he is alive and well on planet Earth. So we need to start there before we move on. Um, Dan, I, f I forgot to ask you before I started. What time did we usually go here before for the CUNY? Till four? Till four? Okay. <laughs> Pardon? Oh. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go to the next one. Here's, here's my first thought. I'm going to miss the Packer game this afternoon. <laughs> okay. 
answers to prayer. My wife and I used to keep a prayer journal. We kept it for two years, and we found that 67%, it was odd that it worked just out to that percentage, 67% of the things we prayed for over two years, we, we were a member of an adult group that just shared all kinds of prayer requests, so our, our little journal was pretty thick, and we counted after that time, and we counted about 67% of answers to prayer, personal answers to prayer, I don't mean the supernatural kind, but just some of them were incredible. And just to know that God spoke, God dealt with us, is another way to say, God's not just alive in the universe, he's personally dealing with myself or my family or my daughter or my father or my, you know, like that. So let's, let's keep that as a backdrop. But I need to move on to this issue of, of people who, uh, we, all of us at some time think that God's ignoring us. Okay. I'm telling you guys this, but I'm not trying to argue that there's so many, there, there are a lot of these events, but I'm not trying to say that this is the normal way God works. Miracles, by definition, are rare. So I'm not trying to say the minute you walk out of church this morning, start looking for love in all the right places because you're going to find a hundred of them today. I'm not saying that. I'm saying treasure the ones you come across. Maybe write them down in a prayer journal. I'm amazed by that old song um, on on prayer and count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I'm amused that we're surprised, but I think one of the reasons we're surprised is because we forget the positive things. We're like little kids, and we forget the positive things, and we're pretty ungrateful toward God. And we remember the things he didn't answer, and we really conveniently uh, Forget the things, like a child. You're praying for a child, and a child's ill. And this could be a bad one, but it could be an okay one. And tomorrow, child's better. And you go, well, that's what the doctor said anyway. And you conveniently forget, but you forget the fear you were in the day before. Just overlook it. And I think we forget how much God speaks, again, not supernaturally so much, but, but just to me. Okay, but... Remember, God doesn't always do that. So in the times when you're not seeing him doing that, you have to kind of balance both sides together. All right? All right, I'm going to give two objections from the side of those who feel they're, they're being ignored by God. And the first objection goes like this. What about my favorite verses? Here's all I want to know. When I was taught in Sunday school as a little child or later, to memorize verses, what kind of verses am I gonna memorize? Well, one popular answer to that is promises. I'm gonna memorize things where God makes promises. And I've memorized certain texts, and it just seems like God doesn't measure up to some of these things. Now here's a couple examples. Three times in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus makes some of the most incredible comments concerning fulfilled I uh, answered prayer. Pray whatever you want in my name, and you'll, you'll get it. And then he says again, whatever, pray, and you'll receive it. How about the one in James chapter 5? Someone's sick? Call the elders. Let them anoint the person with prayer. And the prayer of faith will heal the person. And so the person goes, excuse me? I mean, I know God's alive and well, but either James 5 says God will heal, or James 5 does not say that. But if it says God will heal, I want to know why he didn't. Now, when my, my wife was dying in 1995 with, with stomach cancer, we were up at University of Virginia uh, Hospital, about an hour from our house, and the elders from our church came up to the hospital and anointed her with oil and prayed. Four months later, almost to the day, she died. What does James 5 say? And what about those promises in John? Okay, what do you say? That, that's the objection. Didn't God say? Didn't God promise? Let's look at the next one. All right, here's three things for you to keep in mind. The first one, what do you do with contrary comments? I'm just asking you, what do you do with contrary comments in Scripture? For example, the book in the Bible that has the most claims about healing is the book of Psalms. And the book in the Bible, maybe just because it's so large, 
but the book in the Bible that says the most about God not answering prayer and God not, people not being able to find God when they want him is the book of Psalms. How do you weigh verses that say, I will heal, and verses that say, even in the days of David, I don't know, I look for God, he's not around. Because there are some rough passages in Psalms, if you want to be unedified, but it's in God's word. So read Psalm 44 sometime. It just, I bet you, you didn't know it was there. Or if you read it, it just didn't dawn on you what was going on. But the psalmist says this, we're your people. You crush us all the time. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's because we break your promises. But we're not breaking your promises. We're not. We've been obedient, and you still crush us. We die for your sake, just because you want us to die. And then the verse says this. Wake up and come and save us. And the psalm ends. Wake up? Well, God can't sleep. Remember I said about the attributes of God? God can't be un-God. And God can't be disconnected with his creation, and he can't sleep because he can't do things that are un-God. But the psalmist says, wake up. And there's a lot of passages that cry out like that. So my first comment to you is, if you think you've got this all down, because there's three nice verses in John, and you're right, there are three verses in John. There's a tough verse in James 5. What do you do when there are contrary? What do you do with chapter, uh, books that balance both the answers and the promises and the warnings in the same text? It, it, maybe the conclusion isn't quite as simple as we thought. Okay, second point. What do you do about the media context? Okay, let's look at each one of these. I gave you the verses for the, the um, promises. Here's the same exact context, okay, of the promises. Here's one, John 15, verse 20. Jesus says, if they persecuted you, uh, sorry, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Well, what? I thought you just said whatever we pray for, we'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't pray for the end of persecution, though, because you're going to be persecuted. Whoa. Whoa, I didn't sign up for persecution when I came to Christ. But the same context that promises answers to all your prayers three times says you're going to be persecuted. Same context. All right, here's another one. John 16, 2. Same text. He says that you're going to be suffering. You're going to be suffering in your service to God. You go, well, can I pray that I don't suffer? No, you're going to suffer. What did you mean by I can have everything I want? How about this one? Last verse in John 16. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Well, I'm really glad you've overcome the world, but why do I, why am I going to have trouble when you said I could pray for anything I want? Three times Jesus says, whatever you want, pray for it, you'll get it. And three times in the exact same context, he says, you're going to have issues. In fact, he says once that people are going to think they're doing God a favor when they kill you. I thought I could pray for whatever I want. Lord, please don't let them kill me. And you said I could have whatever I want. No, you're going to be going through persecution. They're going to be killing you. Now, the next chapter in John maybe has the answer. This is the so-called high priestly prayer of Christ. Jesus is alone with his Father. And here's maybe a hint. Jesus is praying in John uh, 7, 14 and 15. And he says, I pray... Not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them in the world. And I started thinking about this. How do we get these two together? What if answers to prayer mean, see, we assume in the West that an answer to prayer means God takes us from the situation. Earlier we got the question about persecution. I said it was coming up in this message. Um, what if praying doesn't mean removed from the situation? What if answering your prayer means God holds your hand through the situation? Because how do I get answer your prayer, answer your prayer, answer your prayer three times, and how do I get persecute, persecute, die, and troubles three times in the exact same passage? 
Maybe we assume God's let us down because the assumption is he didn't take me away from it. And maybe Jesus is saying, I never promised to take you away from it. In fact, let me tell you something. In the New Testament, almost always the person didn't get taken away from it. Read Hebrews 11 sometime with all the problems that people went through in the Old Testament. Women who didn't receive their sons and husbands back because they were killed and they stayed firm to the Lord. They were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God and the prophets who died. And Hebrews 11, we often call it the hall of faith, but it's a series of people who had a lot of nasty things happen to them. I don't read in scripture that God ever says, I will take you away from all your troubles. But I read where God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, I'll be with you in them. How about the other tough one? How about James chapter 5? Does it say that God will heal? Let's go one more. How about the contrast with the same author in the book? What do you do with James 5? Well, let me tell you an example. Because I deal with doubt, and I've written three books on the subject, including one on the silence thing, which is on the back table, uh, people write to me, and I have no idea who they are, and, and they've read something of mine. And one day I got this email, and I've only done this like twice in my life. But I got this email, and I said to my wife, I want you to see this email. You, you've got to read it. And here's how the email went. The woman said, I live in Chicago. I'm a young mother, or I thought I was going to be. And I was pregnant. And there was a problem with the baby. And I was told that it was touch and go, whether my baby was going to live or die. And she said, I go to a charismatic church. In fact, I'm a lay person, but I, I direct the lay program in, in visitation here. So I've been working for the Lord, and I go out, and I lead groups of people out, and we witness, and I'm pregnant, and the baby's coming. And one of the elders in my church said he had been praying for me. And he walked up to me and said, I've been given a word for you from the Lord. Your baby's going to be okay. She said, only my baby wasn't okay. My baby died. Now, sometimes they do this in hospitals. Maybe you've seen this, but this is one of the toughest things I've ever seen. When the baby died, they actually took a photo of the mother and the deceased baby all dressed up, the baby was all dressed up, but the baby was dead. And she was holding the baby in her arm in the hospital bed, and she sent me the photo. It's to help with the grieving process, I, I understand. But she sent me the photo, and she said, why did God let me down? We called the elders, James chapter 5. One of the elders said he heard from the Lord. He said, my baby would be fine. My baby's not fine. If you have, she goes, oh, needless to say, I no longer direct the witnessing program. Notice the volitional doubt here, for those of you who were at last hour. I no longer direct that program. I'm a little upset with God right now. He and I aren't getting along. If you have any guts, you'll call me. Here's my number. My wife came in and read it, and she went, whoa. And then she goes, better call her, and turned around and walked out of the study. <laughs> All right. I called her. And we talked. Our first phone call, we talked for four hours. And here was, this was her most pointed question. I only want to know one thing, she asked me. Does your Bible have James 5 in it? And does your Bible say, the prayer of faith will heal? That's all I want to know. Is James 5 in your Bible? And without a pause, immediately, this is what I said back to her. I'll answer you if you answer me a question. Does your Bible have James 1 in it? I didn't even tell her what James 1 was, and it was to her credit that she knew what I was getting at. And she said, I said, does your Bible have James 1 in it? And she said, oh, no. I never thought of that. You know how James starts? Count it all joy when you fall into problems and you have issues because God's going to work them out in your life and let it have its path and it's going to be rough for a while, but it's going to grow and you're going to come out being mature 
and you're going to be better for it. Now, here, here's my question. She just want to know, is James 5 in the Bible? Yes, it is. And it's a hard passage, and my wife died too. But James 1 is also there. And James says, let me just paraphrase him. James, in order to have James 1, James has got to be saying, it's not always going to work out. Because you're going to have issues, let it take its course, and you'll be a more mature believer. Well, I thought you said all we had to do was call the elders and use the oil. Not always. How do you get James 1 with James 5? I'm not sure. I, I can honestly tell you that. I don't know. <clears throat> there are some rough texts. But it can't mean that the problems will always be solved because James 1 says you're always going to have problems and let them work themselves out. I can't put the three, ask your prayers and get whatever you want and with Jesus with the three in the same context. You're going to be persecuted, killed, and have problems throughout your life. And then the very next chapter, he prays that God not take us out of the world, but that he bless us and hold our hand basically through the problems. So the first lie, as per what we call lies yesterday, the first thing we have to deal with here is, what do we say to ourselves? And here's how pernicious our words are to ourselves. I started by saying, when you go, oh, oh no, you know what oh no means. I thought I had a day off tomorrow, and they say I gotta come into work for half a day. I can't believe it. But all that's rolled up, and, oh. and you know what that means. Well, when we feed ourselves wrong things, we learn wrong things. Because like I said yesterday, I would never lie to me. So I must not be lying to me. I must be telling the truth. All right, now here's the issue. If I say God promised always to heal, but he broke his promises to me, here's what, get this point. It, it's so important. If I say that, for me, God's a liar. In my mind, the way I think about it, God's a liar. God's a promise breaker. God let me down. It's not true, but that's what he is in my mind because I tell myself that. Now, if somebody breaks a promise to you, are you happy with them? They break a promise to you a lot, would you probably not hang around with them quite so much? Would they not be your best friend anymore? If they lied to you, would you probably not hang around with them so much? What happens when God breaks promises and lies? Well, he doesn't do that, but you think he does. You tell yourself he does. You know what uh means. God did it again. What happens? He's not going to be my best friend anymore. And if I miss devotions this week, he had it coming. Look what he did to me. And the distance starts growing. It's the you, you stay in your half of the universe and I'll stay in mine type of thing. But notice what happened? It's not real, it's perceived. But because you're perceiving it, it's truth to you. That's why one of the worst things you can do, we talked yesterday about A's, B's, and C's. Well, God let my child die. That's an A. The A is the baby died. B is what it means. God let me down, I'll no longer direct visitation in our church. God let me down when the elder said my baby was going to live. God's to blame. Those are not true. But they're true for you. So they're going to start germinating. If you tell yourself lies, you'll live lies, and your distance with God will grow. So if you say God doesn't care about me, he doesn't love me, those are lies, but for you they will be true and you'll live like they're true, and when you think of God, you'll have a bad view of him, but it's all self-concocted. It's in your mind, it's your picture, it's my picture, all right? So what about my favorite verses? Doesn't solve the issue, because what do you do about contrary verses? What do you do about the same context? What do you do about books where James 1 doesn't jive with James 5? I, I did give you an idea of how you could get them together, that God doesn't mean I will always heal the person, 
but God means I'll hold your hand through it. Because the Bible talks a lot about going through your issues. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 5. The God who takes us through things so that we'll be able to talk other people through things. That doesn't sound like a life where there's no issues. All right, how about a second objection? But I wish I lived in New Testament times. Didn't God always swoop down and take these people away from the issues? Didn't he always just come in and do a miracle? I've never seen a miracle. But he always did one. Notice the way I'm talking to myself? He always did it then. He never does it now. He's letting me down. My comments are leading me to more false views, but I believe me, so I've got bad theology. Let me tell you something. God almost never takes believers away from tough situations in the New Testament. Almost never. Now, I was doing this lecture one time, and a lady, during the Q&A, she raised her hand, she goes, I've got a case for you where God took somebody away. And I said, well, look, I said, I'm not saying there's never one. There are a few in the New Testament, but there's very few. I said, but which, which one do you have in mind? She said, Acts 17, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison, and they prayed and sang hymns, and the door sprang open, and they got out scot-free, and they went to the jailer who was ready to kill himself, and they ended up leading the jailer of the Lord, and take, the jailer took them home, and a whole family believed and was baptized. And I said, why did the jailer take them home? What happened to Paul and Silas before they were put in the jail cell? They were beaten. They were whipped. If you were Paul, what would you be saying to yourself between the first and the second whip, the second and the third, the third and the fourth, the fourth and the fifth, the fifth and the sixth? What would you have said? Lord, please take me. Uh. Okay, Lord, please, no more. Please take me. Uh. Lord, can you please step in right now? Uh. Does that sound like somebody who's been removed from it? She said, oh, I forgot about that part. <laughs> now, there is one in Acts 13 where the angel comes and gets Peter out, and that's one of the only ones where nothing happens. Let's talk about our Lord, for example. As nearly as I can tell, there are eight incidents in Jesus' life where tough things happen, where, humanly speaking, it would be convenient if his father took him away from them. He never gets away from a single one. Now, there is one, you could argue it's an exception. When Jesus was a little baby, Joseph has a dream, people are trying to kill him, take him away, and they took Jesus to Egypt. Jesus got away. But tell that to the mothers and fathers that lost the babies back in the town. Jesus got away, but they didn't. What about those deaths of those little babies? And in no other incident is Jesus taken away. He's in the garden. Luke, the doctor, says it looks like it was sweat drops of blood. We know that what, what that is. There's a name for it. And it's caused by extreme anxiety. And the capillaries uh, start leaking the blood. That's how much Jesus was suffering. How about the beating before the crucifixion? When, when um, Mel Gibson's movie first came out, I've done a lot of work on the Shroud of Turin, a couple of co-authored books. I heard that Mel Gibson was using the Shroud and I thought, during the movie, first time I saw it, I thought, this is going to be bad. Because I know that the fellow in the shroud has been whipped on every inch of his body, with the exception of his face, his forearms, and his feet. So when they were whipping Jesus' back in the movie, I knew he was going to have to, they were going to turn him over, because the man in the shroud was whipped across the chest and the thighs and the calves. And sure enough, in one of his twisting and turning from the whipping, Jesus flips over, and they start whipping his chest and his stomach and his legs. Did, did the father take him away? He rescued him from the Garden of Gethsemane, right? How about on the cross? We so downplay the words 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How did the Son of God feel? Forsaken. What's another way to say that? Silence. The silence problem occurred to the Son of God. Where are you when I need you most? And he died. He wasn't taken from it. So I don't think there's a lot of help. There's some, good, there's some real interesting passages, but I don't think there's a lot of help going to my favorite verses. And I don't think there's a lot of help, there's almost no help asking about what happens in the New Testament. Because here, Jesus doesn't get out of it. He dies. All right, let me ask you a couple questions. We're getting down toward the end here. Two considerations. All right. Hebrews 5.8 is a staggering verse to me. We know the verse, just a chapter removed from this, tested at all points like as we yet without sin. But how can we don't talk about this verse? Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. What? First of all, we don't really have a place for saying Jesus learned anything. Last verse of Luke 2 says he grew in wisdom and stature. Jesus learned. He was a human being. And he learned obedience from what he suffered. All right, here's my first question for us. Do we learn faster than Jesus learned? Jesus was spurred on by his suffering to learn obedience. Can we learn it faster than the Son of God without the suffering. That's pretty staggering. Second question. Hebrews 2 says that the author of salvation was made perfect through suffering. All right, first question is, do we learn faster than Jesus? Second question is, are we perfected more than Jesus without suffering? Jesus needed it, learned by it, was perfected through it, and we say, sorry, I don't need the perfecting and the learning, I just as soon skip it off. But if we think we're going to use Jesus as an example with our favorite verses, or by citing, didn't God always take people away from the New Testament, he virtually never does. So I would say that until we can answer these, these two considerations, if we don't deserve it more than Jesus, and if we don't learn more quickly than Jesus, I mean, I mean, what's our point? God's letting me suffer. And? Well, they always took people away from the New Testament. Really? After my wife died in 1995, I pictured, and I've, I've published this make-believe dialogue several places, but I pictured... I went on my front porch because my, my wife was sleeping 17, 18 hours a day and I had a, the kids were in school and I had a kitty monitor up in the room and, and I, she had stomach cancer so I had to change the, she had a tube in her stomach and I had to feed her through the tube three times a day and give her four rounds of medicine then I'd take the tubes out and three of my daughters are nurses so I really appreciate what they do, but I'd take the tubes out every day and run vinegar water through them, put the tubes back in and run the food machines. And I was exhausted and I would go out on the front porch periodically and just sit there and I pictured having a conversation with God, sort of a Job 38 sort of time. If you remember Job 38, Job came to, uh, the Lord came to Job and asked him these tough questions. And I, I was, the way my conversation with God was something like this. I would say, Lord, why is Debbie up there dying in the bedroom? She's 43 years old, and I have four kids here, and the youngest one is nine years old. And Lord, you've given me a ministry to do, but I can't do my ministry because I'm getting the kids up in the morning, I'm making their lunches, I, the food has to be ready at night, someone has to do their wash, and my wife's dying, my best friend, she's dying. And I pictured the Lord saying to me, saying back to me, Gary, I know what you're going through. I watched my son die. I watched my son die. Gary, 
Did you ever think that I answered his prayer on the cross? You what? I answered his prayer? What do you mean you answered his prayer? He died. I know, but I answered his prayer. I raised him from the dead on Sunday morning. I said, Lord, that's not an answer to prayer. He died. Oh, no. Are you telling me Debbie has to die? I can't handle this. And I pictured the Lord going on and saying to me, based on what, you should read Job 38. I kind of based it on that dialogue. And I pictured the Lord saying to me, um, Gary, look, I watched, I watched my son die. I raised him. And one day you're going to be in heaven with your wife. You know, the, the card that moved me the most that I got after my wife passed away, when I finally put the cards away, and it was obvious that I was going to get married again, I, I put these, uh, card, my, my mother and my wife were best friends. That's pretty good for a, for a mother-in-law. And she said to me, she said, it's time to put the pictures away. It's time to put the cards up, you know, away. And, and so I was putting them away, and the card I left on top was a card that I could not even repeat to people for about a year. But it said this. It said, imagine the day when you're going to be in heaven with your loved one, and you're going to walk down the streets of heaven hand in hand with your beloved. I thought, oh. I can't read this. I can't get all the way through the card. But it was great. It touched my heart. And I, and I was reminded regularly that that's the kind of world we live in. Christians aren't exempt from suffering, but they weren't exempt from suffering in the early church. And the Son of God wasn't exempt from suffering. And I think God would have taken me by the hand and said, if you have to know, Debbie's going to die but I got your back. And, oh, Lord, how? My mother called it. She said that my wife experienced dying grace. Here's what my mom calls dying grace. She said, he gives all believers dying grace, but you won't have it until you die. So don't wonder about what it's going to be like. You won't know it until you need it. And she said, Debbie taught all of us how to live, and Debbie taught us how to die. And like I said, they were best friends. The Bible never exempts Christians from suffering. I don't always know what to do with your favorite verses, but I knew, do know that it doesn't mean what I think it means because the immediate context and the immediate book tells me that's not the kind of thing I'm talking about, that I'm not promising you a problem-free world. John 14 to 16, three of these and three of these. James 5, but there's also a James 1. That's the way Scripture works. But the worst thing I can do is lie to myself. The worst thing I can do is say some of the following. God doesn't care. God never cares. He always leaves me like this. And then you get together, you need a couple buddies who kind of commiserate with you and lie to you too, right? Yeah, I know, I had a problem like that once and God let me down too. Great, that's just the edification we need. But we keep saying those things to ourselves and our theology gets worse and worse and worse because you remember, bad bees will mold your life, you'll believe them, and the depression, the anxiety, the anger that come from your bad bees, they are self-induced. It's self-induced. God didn't give it to you, it's not biblical, and you have no reason to be upset with God. You don't. Jesus didn't. And you know, I have always had a feeling that God would only need about a sentence, and then we'd say, oh, I never thought of that. That works it all out. But the resurrection, with all its evidences, the resurrection says there is an answer. And the things we started the lecture with, the, the reasons to believe God's alive and well today says there is an answer. And all those personal things says God, God speaks to us. 
So it's a lie to say that God doesn't care. It's, it's a lie to say that God's ignoring us. There is a response. And many other times, he doesn't ignore us when he answers other prayers. And when he gives you spiritual gifts. And when he gives you time out. And when he convicts you of sin. He's not ignoring you. It's just that we want it right there on the spot or we'll never admit any of the other ones work. And that's just wrong. It's just a bad argument. So, as we end this, let's... I think one way to, 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 my best shot at doing the text is that God doesn't take us from problems. He takes us through them. He holds our hand through them. One time I was teaching a class and I had a third world uh, gal in class. And she, want, she kind of challenged the whole class. And she said, she said, I got a question for you Western folks who think God's like a slot machine and you put your nickel in, you get a candy bar, or you go to fast foods and you get your food right away. She said, I'm from, I think she, was, she might have been from Haiti or from the Bahamas. And she said, she said, why do you think we have so many children in our families? I don't know. Don't know what birth control is? I don't know. We have all these smart aleck kind of responses. And she said, we have so many children because half of them die and the other half become the parent's life insurance policy when they get to be old. She said, we live in a world where things happen. We're not tempted to say God ignores us because we see it in an everyday world. Who tells you folks that you don't have to go through any of it, that you can live without it? She said, that's a Western idea. That's not an Eastern idea. And that's not a biblical idea. And we sort of sat there like, And I thought she made really good sense. We require that God be a certain way because that's how our world is. And we want it all like that. And we think we've got verses to back us up, but it can't be because he didn't act like that in the New Testament. He doesn't act like that today. Let's go on here. I'm just about done. Lessons. Here's some things for you to think about. Learn God's truth and don't emphasize one angle over another one. When God puts you in time out, celebrate that. When he convicts you of a sin, that's a personal love letter from God. Collect your love letters, write them down, remind yourself of them, and then you're less likely to think God's abandoned you when something else doesn't work, okay? Be careful to say what we do, what we say to ourselves, because when you blame God, you're causing emotional problems that are not based on anything in Scripture. You think they are, but they're not. I think they are, but they're not. And I've made problems for myself, psychological problems that are going to come, anger, depression, anxiety. They're going to rise, and guess what? For the sake of saying I don't want to hurt, I'm causing myself to hurt twice as much. How logical is that? So we should clean up what we say to ourselves, clean up our words, not lie to ourselves. God does not ignore us. There's so many indications that he doesn't. He's alive, he's well, he answers our problems. Not always the way we want, but he promised to be with us. And that's the promise of scripture, and that's what these evidences, and that's what this reality says.